in the best tool. There are drawbacks to using proprietary. We've explained them and explored them before. There's drawbacks to using open source software for some people, um, and then we've explored those before. Um, so it's a it's a mixture of both. Now the ideal world would be every piece of software on your computer is available to you to look at the source code, make your own modifications, and uh, to work from the ground up if there's an issue um, that you can solve yourself. However, we've got to remember that probably 98% of all computer users are not that way inclined um, and will just want computers to switch on, bang on the Facebook, a couple of comments. Right, but that, that's a misguided argument for the following reasons. Uh, you have to ask, are we interested in them changing the code? No. That they might have a friend who is able to change the code, that's another thing. The third thing you might argue is that the programmer, uh, knowing that people will be able to view the source code and change that, will not do certain things. It's kind of like asking, is the person going to, uh, you know, take a shotgun and go to the streets with it, knowing that the police might come and do something about it? Now, because he knows something will happen, he's not going to do that. Uh, here, likewise, the developer might want to put a uh, backdoor, remote deletion, something like that, knowing that he can get away with it. Now, if the source code is out, he knows he's putting his cards on the table, he's putting his ammunition out, he's, he's exposing himself. Now, knowing this type of you know, precaution, the behavior will change. The question is, can we change the behavior of programmers and companies because they know the code is out there? And we're trying to discipline the programmers or the companies to uh, not use the uh, binarization of the code, uh, putting it in machine code, not to use that against the consumers, against the users, and try to take even more power to disable people's books, to take away their uh, copyrights to take away their uh, ability to access things that they have, like photos, or to charge them extra money for a codex to, to view family, you know, family videos and things like that. Uh, all of this, all of these are issues of basically control. Give us the source code, we've got control as the consumers. Give us just binaries, you make us dependent on the person with access to the source code, and that's the reason we want the source code to be available for the application in general. It's, I mean, that's that. Has been made to me before, and I completely agree. You can always argue the case that you, developers put in, or the coder was putting their cards on the table by presenting the source code. You've also got to keep in mind, though, I think, the the requests or the desire of the developer themselves and their, their wants. And just not releasing the source code for whatever reason doesn't necessarily suggest a dubious intention behind that. Um, the other point I'd make as well is that a lot of people that have issue with users, using using code or using a software that doesn't uh, readily give its source code over to them. Um, there's so many examples in real in the real world that we use now which don't. Uh, the best one would probably be the cash point machine. Um, I can't think of any cash point terminal that will give you the source code uh, or it's on the net for any cash point terminal that will use any ATM. So one could argue that the argument to put um, that closed source is not, you know, it's sort of high, is hiding its dubious intentions. Have you, you can argue that with any software. You can argue that with a cash point machine. I think it's a bit different because there is a standard for how banks basically do their thing. So you know the bank isn't going to be very malicious to you. Oh, exactly. And there yeah. will can be some kind of administration of things. But when you're talking about developers doing uh, things at a level where they have shareholders trying to maximize profits based on perhaps you know locking in the, the users, I don't think banks to the same extent use the ATM points to do that. They don't actually try to extort you or to press to to make you use the exact same ATM every time you use it. No, but you know, the, 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 I mean, the, the argument of the backdoor in, so, in code that you can't see the source for could be yeah. leveled at the cash flow machine, which you don't see the source I for. I think that's a security thing yeah. that's different from control. Of course it is. And you, what, you, you, you don't truly really want people who use the ATM to control the ATM because that leads to all kinds of issues. Yeah. But, but it's still the fact still remains that the, because the code is closed, there could be any piece of code in there. For example, if uh, there's people with privacy concerns, for, a, for all any regular user of an ATM knows, there could be a piece of code in there which will record and send on to interested parties the amounts that you're, uh, that you're withdrawing and at what time. We don't know because you don't see the code. The point I was making though was the fact that um, personal responsibility and responsibility for any dubious in, um, or malicious code on any, on any piece of software would then come down to the developers directly themselves if it was proved, as in the bank case I just gave, that something dubious was happening with the data uh, mm. or the user that was using it. Then There's they would loads of audits on this type of code because the code is pretty simple. 
and they have to make sure it's completely, almost completely bug free. Uh, if you look at the online banking sites, they're very, very strict in what they have to uh, I'm, like, I'm sure. the browser because they check every because because the, the 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 risk of loss there if they screw things up they can lose you know they can have billions in losses and and so the the, the applications are very simple and it's very rigorously tested and audited so I think if some mischievous programmer wanted to like put it back door to pass all the money to his own account you know, they will catch it very easily at some well, stage I, I can cite an example from about I believe this is about ten years ago um, and it's for those that don't know, in the UK we have quite stringent licensing laws, um, and one of the licensing laws that we have covers uh, the use of gaming machines, gambling machines, or fruities, whatever you want to call them. There was a, a, a scandal a few years back, and we're going back about 10 years now, where the coder of a fruit machine actually developed a routine within the um, bandit itself, the machine itself, whereby he'd come along, press a combination of buttons, or do something uh, in respect of using it, and the machine would pay out everything within its uh, cash box. Um, and I can't remember how he was how he was found. I'll have to research this one next. It's a really interesting story. This I think happened about ten years ago. Now there is an example of something that's heavily regulated. The licensing laws are very very stringently followed and regulated. And the use of gaming machines, especially in uh, pubs yeah. and clubs, etc. Yet he was able to do this. Now the, the point the is, boxes yeah. and, uh, I mean the, the point is, is this isn't commonplace, but the ethos of not sharing source, um, you know, is something that spreads. Throughout the uh, throughout society, yeah, there's lots of applications we use which we'll never see the source for, which we put a lot of faith in. If you're going to make the argument of dubious or malicious or whatever you want to call it, code, we put a lot of faith in and never actually see the source. This is one again one of those double-edged sword arguments because I can actually argue the other way as well. Um, but in the interest of fairness, I just want to put that point across because in areas that you would think would be secure, it's not. Um, and I think, you know, if a developer decides to release a piece of software, be it proprietary, closed source, whatever, it's obviously their decision to release it in whichever way they want. In the end, users' decision as to whether they want to use it or not. Um, I, I use Skype quite a bit. I take full responsibility for using that Skype. I'm very well aware of the implications of, it, uh, of using Skype. I use quite a few proprietary packages as well. And again, I'm very well aware of the uh, implications of that. Um, suffice to say, there's Probably now, I can't think of many examples of where you have a proprietary piece of software that isn't already catered for in the open source world. Um, obviously, the traditional one which comes up with a uh, all the time, and I can't comment because I don't use it, is uh, Photoshop, and then people make the comparison to GIMP. I don't use either enough to be able to make any comments. I can't say how well they compare to each other. Um, but one thing that I can relate to, and it was... Um, Something which I meant to bring up a bit earlier on, but this sounds now is an ideal opportunity to bring it up. And that was the, there's an article on, uh, that was linked on Tux Machines, and I'm just bringing it up now because I've closed it inadvertently by accident. And it was in Bruce regards... Bruce about the LibreOffice versus yes. uh, Microsoft Word. So, so yeah. basically, uh, Bruce Beitel has been write, writing about Office Suites and been assessing them very, very closely for the past, like, four or five years, and he's doing a very good job doing that. Um, and now he's doing a comparison in terms of features in, in Office and uh, in the, I suppose, the mainstream alternative now, and the Linux distribution now is LibreOffice. Uh, so I haven't read the articles properly. Maybe. No, I mean, I, I've, I've, I've briefly glimpsed down it, and I mean, it's been, it's been a while since I've used Microsoft Word to any depth. Um, I have to say, for honesty purposes, at work we use Microsoft Office. Um, however, my use of it is no more than a few paragraphs of text and a bold underline and italics type usage. It's, it's nothing more complex than that. It's, I don't require it for any more than that. So I can't really say how far um, LibreOffice has come. LibreOffice, again, provides exactly the same functionality for me at home. And if I had the choice of Microsoft Word on this machine, there'd be no reason for me to buy it because LibreOffice fills my needs. Whether that fills your needs is something uh, that you need to look into. But Looking down the uh, the list, it seems that obviously it's going to have a pro LibreOffice slant. Otherwise, I wouldn't expect it to be uh, to be on here. Um, but it's uh, it, it has 12 points anyway, and it's um, it'd be very interesting to see what other people have to think about this because I can't really comment in respect of Microsoft Office because I don't know. Um, but yes, it's talking about page styles, styles and formatting of window compared to the Navigator. Um, and I think it's quite favourable in respect of 
LibreOffice, which I don't think comes as any surprise to any of the people that use it. Yeah, this is the strong component of LibreOffice as well. If you look at things like presentation, that's usually what the comparisons to uh, uh, PowerPoint and things like that will pale in comparison. So, so some people say that the most mature